Okay, fantastic. Well, I know we've got a packed agenda today, so perhaps I'll start. Um, so firstly, just on behalf of us all at Nudge, I'm absolutely delighted to welcome you to this, our latest event, where we'll be revealing and discussing the new wave of well-being. And quite frankly, it's great to be talking about something other than Biden or Trump. Um, now, there's nothing in this world that connects us all like money, regardless of how much or, or how little of it we've got, or whether we're a whiz or a, a novice. As Lisa Minnelli sang in her Academy Award winning cabaret in 1972, money makes the world go round. Um, and actually, as a quick aside on the subject of money and music, make sure you look out for our latest Nudge Money Music playlist, which is coming very soon. Uh, my thanks to my colleague Sydney for being, being the compare on this, and I understand it's going to be trending on Spotify, so look out for that one. Um, but back with a bump to the topic in hand, because money affects us all, financial well-being is very much the benefit for everyone, not just in its own right, but also as a foundation for the rest of our lives, be that our dreams, our goals, and of course our mental well-being. Now, as I explained in our latest research, it's over 18 years that I've been helping people better understand their finances. And that's through my work as a benefits advisor, uh, a trustee of an education charity, and, and now co-founder of Nudge. And it's been absolutely fascinating, not to mention incredibly rewarding. And over all of those years and different forums, the audience has been incredibly diverse everyone from children to retirees, bankrupts, to multimillionaires and, and the vulnerable unemployed, uh, including prisoners and, and all sorts through to defined benefit pension employment lifers. And when I look back over those interactions, a couple of things stand out for me. Uh, number one, money is getting more complicated. So whether it's pensions, tax, credit scores, mortgages, uh, government support, yeah, all of these things are more complicated than ever before, uh, despite the efforts of the Office of Tax Simplification, or for those of you as, as old as me, you might remember Pension Simplification, you know, both initiatives that you'll probably remember did anything other than actually simplify things. Um, number two is that people are flying closer and closer to the sun. And so what I'm saying is that from a personal finance perspective, people's circumstances are increasingly fragile. And for many, COVID has brought the chicken home to roost. Um, as evidence of this, just last week, the IFS, the Institute of Fiscal Studies, reported that the poorest 20% had suffered a £170 a month decline in income between March and September, which is a decline they could ill afford. And so over my 18 years, the link between financial literacy and financial wellbeing has become undeniable. And this was one of the key drivers for Jeremy, who's also joining us today, and I establishing Nudge, um, that vision to create a really focused specialist providing financial education to improve financial literacy. Um, we're really proud of the difference we're making to our community, so not just the employees of our employer clients through Nudge for Work, but also wider populations through uh, Nudge for Business proposition. Now, another thing that we're particularly proud of is this latest research, the elephant in the workplace. Um, there are some fascinating learnings in this research, but I'll summarise shortly. But big picture, it's great to now have the really robust data confirming that link between financial literacy and well-being. We always had the anecdotal evidence, and now we've got the data. And this isn't just exciting to us. Um, we've been blown away by the exposure that this research has had in the press. If three years ago, this would have just been an industry thing, just the employee benefits press. But as evidenced by the reporting by the Independent, the Express, um, the lifestyle publication Refinery29, and, and indeed tech giant Yahoo, this is unique research on an incredibly hot topic. And I think as this broad exposure shows, this isn't just a workplace issue. Um, but as many of you will have heard from us before, we believe that employers are in a unique position to solve the growing financial well-being uh, problem. Um, and as employers, you know who your people are. Um, you provide the lion's share of their financial provision and you've got a unique relationship with them. They trust you in a way they don't trust other organizations. Um, and just to confirm, I've seen a question pop up just to let you know um, we will be sending the deck across afterwards. So you don't need to take screenshots. Um, 
furthermore, as an impetus to do something, the business case and return on investment is incredibly strong. And we're delighted to be joined today by uh, Nudge Friend, Suzanne Jacobs, who's founder of uh, The Seven, who's going to talk to us about the impact of poor well-being and performance at work. Uh, my colleague, Laura, will then host a panel discussion with Alison, Sandra, Lindsay, Suzanne, and, and Mark. I think I've got everyone there, yeah. Uh, how they're supporting financial well-being today and how we can shine a light forward in the future. And then I'm really excited to hear from our CTO, James, who's going to introduce us to the new uh, wave of well-being tech, um, albeit via pre-recording, he's actually unavailable today. And then we'll finish off with a Q&A and some closing remarks from my co-founder, Jeremy. So let's look at the report. What does it tell us? Now, I'm going to focus on three distinct areas. The problem, the solution, and the opportunity ahead of us if we use this solution to solve the problem. So firstly, the problem. Perhaps unsurprisingly, financial well-being is low and it's declining. And we can't blame this solely on COVID. COVID's actually accelerated a longer-term trend that we were seeing. 42% um, of people said that financial well-being has, uh, has worsened in the last six months. And this compares to 26% who said that financial well-being had improved over that period. So the two aren't offsetting each other. And the impact of this declining well-being is significant. As I mentioned, we'll hear more from Suzanne in a bit. But from our research, 66% of people are cutting back on, spend, on spending, but that is unfortunately not enough. 26% are spending their savings. But let's not forget that there's 15% of us in the UK that don't have any savings. So with no savings to go into, the only place is debt. Um, and 53% of HR and reward professionals say that financial stress of their employees is having a negative impact on their business. The other huge impact from a declining financial situation is mental well-being. And as you can see, 52% of people admit to worrying about money once a week and 25% say their mental health is suffering. So that might be uh, what to some of us might seem like simple admin of talking to the bank or opening a brown envelope, uh, making a budget. And that can just all feel too difficult for some people. Um, dealing with the benefit system, um, you know, money can affect your relationships, can affect your social life, which have a knock-on effect on your mental health. And this shows just how intrinsically linked money and mental health are, but how by supporting financial well-being you've got an effective way of ultimately supporting mental well-being. Um, the problem's also compounded by the support available at work. So 67% of our respondents said that their employer isn't doing enough to help their financial well-being, which when you consider how strong the business case is and the fact that employers want to help, um, it's, it's quite shocking, really. So that's the problem. Let's look at the solution. Um, there's two parts to this. Firstly, how do employees want to be supported? And then secondly, are employers up for it? You know, are they wanting and committed to provide support? Now, if the attendance of this webinar is anything to go by, I'd suggest they are, but um, let's look at the detail. So looking at what people want, we asked people, we asked the respondents, what's important to you when it comes to your money? And we gave them lots of options as well as a free type box. And the options included things like having a regular income, having enough to save for the future, um, having the skills and, and knowledge to better manage money, uh, earning as much as you can, uh, being able to talk openly, and also having a trusted source of financial advice. Now, the most striking stat was that while 64% of people uh, said that their earning as much as possible was important to them for financial well-being, a third more than that, 85% of people, said it was actually about having the appropriate skills and knowledge. And you know, this is brilliant to hear, not only for us as a financial education provider who's focusing on skills and knowledge, but also for anyone, including yourselves, who's looking to improve financial well-being. You know, we have limited, if any, influence on people's earnings, but what we can influence is their skills and knowledge. And in fact, as employers, nobody is in a better position to do that than you. So that's what um, employees want. On to the second part, are employers up for it? Well, in short, yes, they are. Um, there's some incredibly compelling stats in this regard. So as we can see here, 79% of HR and reward people agree that people should feel comfortable talking about money at work. And 69% agree that it's been a priority since COVID. 
and over half of the respondents said they would like to do more to support well-being, but perhaps they don't quite know where to start. So there is work to do with senior stakeholders. Um, a third of, of respondents say that they don't have enough support at board level to implement the measures, um, but we are seeing the tide changing there. So we know we've got a problem. Um, we know we've got, we've got a solution which is built around skills and knowledge. What's the opportunity to apply the solution? Well, it's really encouraging that the research shows that confidence in managing money leads to better overall life gratification. So people who are confident in managing their personal finances are twice as likely to report financial well-being. And in turn, those with good financial well-being are 23 times more likely to be content with their overall life. Um, I think it's, it's perhaps obvious that without worrying about money, people have more mental energy to focus on living a happy life. So to conclude my introduction, um, just within time, um, this research demonstrates that poor financial well-being has an impact on the workplace um, through distracted and, and dra drained employees and fragile financial well-being is linked to anxiety and stress and, and so forth. And that although this report reveals a worrying state, there are beacons of light. Uh, the first is the unique opportunity that you as employers have to lead on the issue and the tangible returns for doing so. The second, as a result of this report, we've got such a good view now of what financial well-being means to people, um, which is obviously essential to creating a, a solution. And thirdly, in supporting well-being, organisations are helping people combat that largest contributor to the hot topic of the moment, mental well-being. So those are the beacons of light, and that they are, I guess, what we see behind this new wave of well-being. I hope today inspires you. Thanks for joining us, and I'm delighted to pass over to Suzanne. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Tim. Um, I'm going to use the technology. Hope it's going to work. Share my screen. So. It's all, uh, all come up from you. So yeah, there, there's me, my nice uh, my mug shot on there. But uh, yeah, it's an absolute pleasure to be here. Um, uh, this hugely valuable event to talk about actually what I know is the most critical performance factor, and that's well-being. Um, so I'm an I'm an organisational behavioural and performance expert. Um, I specialise in trust. In um, I have a, a career spanning almost three decades, frighteningly enough, uh, the majority of which has been at senior leadership levels, um, mainly leading very large, high performing, um, diverse teams. But um, what I do now is I really I combine my experience with over a decade of research into the neurobiology of trust and intrinsic motivation. Um, what I want to be able to do is translate and bring the science and practical evidence based tools for human leadership. Um, and financial well-being has such an impact within all of this. We need to be able to have, um, you know, a, a new wave of well-being, but also a new wave of leadership, leadership 4.0, that is able to un unlock the skills and the potential that we have and required for industry 4.0. Um, and of course, to be able to navigate the uncertainty and change that we're, we're all facing now. But what I absolutely know from not only from my own experience, but also from research that your psychological health and well-being is the key indicator, key performance indicator, bar none. And yet what's fascinating to me as a researcher, but what's, what's interesting is that we've actually unintentionally created work places and spaces that actually work against in the main uh, what we really need to thrive the way we have been working has simply not been working. And engagement, um, engagement's been falling. Productivity has not increased, in, particularly in the UK, uh, but also wider for over a decade. And unfortunately, workplace stress or distress is a leading cause of mortality. So as Tim was saying, you know, there, there's, there's the problem. We have a problem. And these issues have been amplified by the global pandemic but what it's done is it's brought to the fore what many of you I know have been pushing for for a long time is to bring well-being to the c-suite agenda there is a performance and well-being equation that we need to be applying and a critical element of this is financial well-being 
but the starting place is is trust the the start of the equation is trust trust is often also referred to in the workplace as psychological safety it is the performance currency it's the it's the baseline the starting point it's it's when the brain trusts its environment it enters a safe state and it switches on our reward centers which flood our bodies with protective feel-good neurochemicals designed to motivate us to do more of what we're doing to keep us safe. This is the seat of intrinsic motivation. It's the discretionary effort that we often look to attain within our businesses. And when this process is lit up and it literally lights up the brain, there is a direct and positive link to our health our well-being, our performance, our creativity, our connection. In fact, our ability to be able to tap into the human skills and strengths require, required now to grow and adapt for this fourth industrial age. And as well as our resilience to ride this storm of uncertainty and the change that, as I say, we're all facing right now. Now, I wanted to give you a, a, a a flavor of what that equation is and how financial well-being plays such a vital role within this. Um, trust is often talked about by leaders, but I often when I'm, I'm supporting leaders, they often scratch their heads and say, yeah, yeah, we, we, we get, we understand that it's a good thing to have, but actually how do we do it? How do I get it? How do I apply it? Um, and there are, in addition for what the brain seeks out as safety as trust, you know, things like food and shelter and warmth, etc. There are seven ingredients, seven ingredients for trust and psychological safety. And I want to show you how financial well-being affects, affects every single one of them. These are the seven drivers of trust, psychological safety. They all, when they're nurtured, they, they leverage cognitive advantage as well as tapping into the significant health and well-being benefits that we can all enjoy. And as leaders and as HR practitioners, we can use these neurological drivers, this checklist, if you like, to, along with proven tools and techniques, uh, to become conscious architects of a truly, a really, truly inclusive cultures of trust. And as I said, financial well-being touches every single one of these seven drivers. So why? Well, I want to give you just some of the links, which are also contained uh, in summary in, in, in the research report. So our finances, just as Tim was saying, represent so much more to us than simply counting the pennies. They bring us freedom. They bring us a sense of choice and autonomy and the ability to exercise agency in our lives. Voice is one of the seven drivers of trust. Without a sense of influence, a control, our threat circuitries are, are switched on, they fire up and they draw our energy and attention away from our work and other aspects of our lives. To focus on actually just trying to find a way out and to regain control. But without the right tools, without the understanding, without that financial literacy, we can find ourselves lost with absolutely no pathway to safety. Now our level of income, our financial position um, and our, our finances can be an expression also of our self-worth and our status. As human beings, we seek a, a level of relative position to those within our societal groups. And it's, it's why perceived and reduced financial status and, and comparable significance within our community can induce feelings of shame and a sense of inequity, inequality, and social exclusion. Those last two are our major threats for the brain. And again, as, as I've shown here, they, I've put the, 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 them as crosses here as they can be so quickly removed from financial insecurity, but they, uh, they trigger that threat circuitry. And next, we all seek a sense of direction. And a direction is a sense of purpose, a sense of meaning in our lives. Our finances can play a huge part in our capacity to follow our dreams. Um, being able to focus on the meaning over the actual amount of money we have delivers directly intrinsic reward. 
Now, security, certainty, and predictability certainly is not things that we're all experiencing right now in the bigger, wider world, but actually we seek it, we crave it. Um, they're obviously things our finances support, but we are animals that need a sense of reliability. Our brains are pattern matching systems. It takes them on board stimulus and data and it tries to pattern match it against past experience. And without a sense of predictability or ambiguity, insecurity, there are no files to match against. So again, that threat circuitry is fired up. We need a sense of reliability, not just in our present, but also in our future. The insecurity circling us kindles that threat circuitry. It keeps it bubbling away. And the hardship as Tim was mentioning, the hardship already being faced by so many and the worries about potential insecurity. So I want to make a, a point here that it's not just that we are being directly impacted right now. It may be right now you're OK. Right now you still have the job. But actually, whilst some are not being directly impacted as such, Others are being incredibly impacted by the situation we're facing right now. But however it's affecting us, we can be depleting our cognitive performance because we may be thinking about potential insecurity or potential worry, potential job insecurity or finances, or it's actually physically here now. And whatever's happening here, it is draining our cognitive performance, it's draining our energy, and it is significantly impacting our well-being. And it may be that they're just thoughts at the moment. Finances also bring us that opportunity to grow, to be able to learn and to experience different things in the world and in our lives. To be able to stretch ourselves is vital for trust, for psychological safety. When we don't understand, when we don't have the tools, when we're worried about, or perhaps we're constrained by our finances, we can find ourselves trapped in our circumstances. And that can be actual, or as I said before, with that sort of potential insecurity, as now that, that sense of constraint or worry can be actual or it can be brought on by a level of catastrophizing our thoughts. We're very good at the what if. Um, it's fantastic worry, actually, it has a survival basis to it. If we didn't worry, we wouldn't notice the things we need to deal and solve. It is basically our problem solving mechanism but we can get stuck in it. We can get stuck in that what's called rumination and worry about catastrophizing and the thoughts that we may have. So in short, from trust through to motivation, well-being, engagement and performance. And remember engagement and performance are outcomes. We need to start with the environment that really helps us thrive. Our well-being, our intrinsic motivation, every single one of those seven ingredients, those seven drivers of trust that spark intrinsic motivation and support well-being, are directly supported by financial well-being and financial literacy. So to conclude, um, I hope that this very short space that we've had today has brought you some insight, backed up beautifully by this piece of research by Nudge, into the critical need to support financial well-being as part of your people and your culture strategy. It is not a tick box. It is not a nice to have. It is a vital underpinning um, of psychological safety and creating and being conscious architects of, of the experience of, of trust that individuals have when they work with you. It is the elephant in the room. Um, and as we bring greater understanding and financial literacy to a wider audience, we can also break down the stigma and provide the practical tools to support individuals to gain control or take back control of their own financial well-being. We need to work differently. We have the tools and the knowledge to do so and the behavioural science to make new healthy habits stick. This is a truly unique time to resource humans, to build human leadership skills and to ultimately reimagine and reshape our workspaces so they are human fit to deliver a new wave of well-being. So thank you 
uh, I now have the, the absolute pleasure of handing over to, to Laura Meniz de Agro, um, Nudge's VP of Revenue and Growth, and who will be hosting our panel discussion. And I look forward to uh, furthering the conversation. Brilliant. Thank you, Suzanne. Well, I think whether it be the data that Tim took us all through or Suzanne's seven intrinsic drivers of trust, I think we can all definitely agree there is no such thing as a tick box anymore when it comes to financial well-being. So now I'm super excited to move into the panel. Um, discussion. Um, these are your peers, they're practitioners, they are doing, they're facing the same challenges you are. Um, so what I'm going to do is just introduce everyone for time and then we're going to get straight into the questions. So I'm delighted this morning, uh, we're joined by Sandra Shipley from SSE, we're joined by Lindsay McDonald from Capgemini, we're joined by Alison Dodd from AWE and Mark Winterflood from Hastings. I know Suzanne, I'm sure you will chip into this conversation as well. So what I want to do without further ado, if it's okay by everyone, I'm going to start with a question. So over to you, Sandra, for my first question, please. So the, the last few months, I think in rewards, well-being, HR, it's been tough, right? So have, has that impacted your benefit engagement at all? And if so, how? Um, well, absolutely. I think like everybody, um, it's been a really tricky time for people over the last seven, eight months. We've seen a massive engagement in well-being and the financial, emotional and um, physical well-being aspects. Um, for us, it, uptake in counselling services has obviously gone up. Um, lockdown made the cycle to work scheme go through the roof. Everybody wanted a bike to be able to get outside. Um, but for us, financial well-being is always the one where people are least likely to talk about it. They still aren't going to want to talk about it openly. So we have to make sure that there's things ready for people when they, they need to find information. For us, um, we did a learning at work week at SSE. And as part of that, Nudge joined us and ran some master classes. And that, that was great. That was just helping people explore the tools that are available to them. It gave them the ability to empower themselves, which I think is what's really important right now. There's so little control in our lives. We don't know what's happening from one day to the next. We're all working in strange environments. And I just think that having that ability and giving people the tools that they can go and use and give them the opportunity to get some control back with their financial um, position, I think is the best thing. So that's actually what we've been focused on over the last little while. Perfect. Thank you, Sandra. Now I'm going to come back to you with a second question shortly, if that's all right. But uh, Lindsay, I know Capgemini, you've got an amazing benefits package. Um, and I think, you know, from, from what I've heard, you've had some great success with Nudge. So what's your secret recipe for success of when you're launching a new benefit? How do you keep that engagement high throughout? Um, well, I'm sure this is a challenge for most businesses, um, but at Capgemini, we've got over 7,000 employees spread out across the UK and not everyone engages in the same way. So we are always looking at new ways to communicate and remind people of the benefits that are available. Um, and so, for example, since the move to working from home, we've created a Capgemini at Homes team with four different streams. So this includes a wellbeing stream. It's been a great success. So employees are really engaged. Um, it's a really quick and snappy um, tool that we can issue reminders of the benefits that are available. Um, we work very closely with our suppliers on virtual awareness events, and we also directly sort of link out to the wellbeing benefits via our flexible benefits platform. So we already have high engagement with that platform, but as soon as someone accesses that, again, they're reminded of the benefits that are available to them. We, of course, utilise Nudge. So in addition to the specific reward nudges that we issue and the master classes that we hold, we do take time to review the standard nudges for opportunities to remind people of the support that's available to them. So, for example, the World Mental Health Nudge that was issued last month, this included a reminder of the EAP and the Thrive Mental Wellbeing Act that we have. So I guess, you know, as we're all aware of the strong link between the two. That sounds great, Lindsay. I mean, it's interesting what you were saying there about almost making sure that these other initiatives, well-being benefits that you have, 
coexist and complement the existing technology or benefit portfolio that you've already got, whether that be your flex system, making sure it's all intertwined with that, but also making sure that whatever well-being solutions that you're launching promote those other benefits as well, the EAP. So that sounds really good that you've, you've really interlink well-being and benefits, it sounds. Yeah, definitely. Fantastic. And, and Alison um, from AWE, I guess a, a similar question to you. I know that you've got a really great variety of benefits. How are you making it clear to people what's on offer and, and most importantly, why it's important for them as an individual? Thanks, Laura. Um, yeah, it, very similar to what, what Lindsay was saying in terms of really working to bring everything together. Now, we, we have laid the foundations in our organisation to have a, have a very comprehensive benefit, a benefit package, you know, pension, EAP, occupational health, flexible benefits, financial education and so on. But what we realise is that, you know, despite having all of these uh, benefits in place, employees really still don't access everything. They're not taking the decisions um, we, what we want them to take. To, to enable them to, to have more control over their immediate um, financial situation and also their future financial situation. We've tried to assess this to, to, to why that's the case and we sort of concluded that there perhaps is just too much um, information out there um, in a very disjointed way. Um, all of the information is fantastic, but I think our employees are, are somewhat overwhelmed um, they just do not know where to turn and they will continue to rely on friends, family, colleagues to tell them what to do. Um, and so we decided we needed to bring everything together. Um, and so what we are doing at AWE, um, first of all, is we've implemented a well-being strategy um, of which financial well-being is one of one of those key key pillars. Um, we have an ambition to simplify the messaging for all of our staff, very much the same as, as Lindsay um, just articulated, which is making it clear how everything um, uh, everything um, plays its part. We um, we use Nudge to promote um, um, and explain our benefit package um, with our specific rewards. Um, and that has in itself been a really good foundation for us. But what we're starting to do now is to really um, optimize all of the resources that we have available from all of our benefit providers um, and our, our suppliers that, that support us in the organization by building learning curriculum for, for our staff, primarily to start with segmented by age. Um, there are so many different ways you can segment your workforce. Um, we always talk about segmentation, um, but I sometimes think it's very difficult to know where to start. And we've decided to start with age, primarily um, initially focus on, on our pre-retirement population. We have a, you know, about 40% of our workforce are due to retire in the next 10 years, um, which I think is a problem probably shared with, with many employers. Um, and what we're going to be trying to do is bring together all of the resources that we have available to support those individuals in the widest sense on their well-being. Um, we often get asked, can you help us with retirement planning? That really is a very small aspect of supporting that broader well-being. And so we will be um, using Nudge. Um, our employee assistance program provider, our income protection provider, to provide a almost a, a, a course for our our staff to go on that will um, uh, address a whole host of concerns, issues that they may have, and improve their knowledge so that they can start to take control of their 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 financial well-being and then their broader well-being. So that's really what our, what our plans are going forward to, to sort of start bringing everything together. 
That sounds fantastic, Alison. I'm sure there's lots of people on this call that want to pick your brains about this learning curriculum and how you are segmenting it. So again, just reminding people, do submit any questions in the Q&A. We will be carving out some time at the end to answer your questions. Um, coming on to Mark from Hastings Direct. So I know Hastings Direct have been at really at the forefront of the wellbeing agenda for many, many years. And Mark, I'd love for you to share your tips on how you get senior leadership buy-in to invest in well-being strategies. Uh, morning, Laura. Um, thank you for having me on. Um, so yeah, it, we were very fortunate. Um, about five years ago, we realized we needed to do something very different. Our leaders were ill-equipped in dealing with mental health and that was becoming, that was on the rise. Colleagues were just throwing away the EAP cards as they went out of meetings. And I did feel when you sat there at whatever meeting you were at, whether it's capability, disciplinary investigation, well-being, the leaders saw it as a tick box exercise. I think somebody on the panel mentioned this. It's definitely a tick. And then they would what? They would never look at the individual and think, actually, the words that were coming out of the mouths, they weren't really, um, they weren't reflecting the mood of the individual. And um, and then, of course, we were doing very sporadic well-being events all around the country, which we wanted to bring under one roof. So we did a trial in parts of our operations, and then we fed that back to senior leaders and certainly the board. And, I've, and, I, and if HR have not got well-being on the board at this moment in time, we're missing a great opportunity to get that buy-in. I think our, our workforce are now are looking to the employers to help. And I think Tim mentioned this in his talk, that it's not just about financial. Financial has an impact on not just the, you know, the finances, it's, it's mental, it's physical, it's being able to go out and enjoy yourself. Well, you can't in the next four weeks. However, you know, you go having experiences. So it, it all connects in some shape or form. So having that top down is just as important as the bottom up. We were very lucky when we had, when you start with nothing, anything that you introduce is going to be a bonus. Um, and so when we started hearing because it's always really hard to get return on investment for, for well-being because people never ring me up and say, I'm in a really good place today. Thanks for, for everything you've done. You, you, you will never get that. Um, but what you do start hearing is, is that how to produce any scorecards. It's tough. It's tough producing something that you, you can't get anything tangible. Um, but what I have done over the years is I've, I've, I've balanced it with narratives, stories. Mm -hmm. And people are happy to share you stories about how you know, they've been able to, 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 to I don't know, I, I've got, I can pick up hundreds of them, but people were telling me how they're able to run around with their kids. Um, and they'd never done that before, but they just make those slight incremental changes. And that's all it is. You're not forcing people to, um, to do anything. You'll get well-being fatigue over time. But with the senior leaders, and especially our CEO, he led it from the, from the very beginning. And so when you get the buy-in from them, and then they start hearing the stories within their departments, coming through then you know you're then starting to get the buy-in from senior leaders etc and get them to do some real life stories if you can you know if they're able to share some personal stories then it really is very very powerful I love that Mark and I think you know here at Nudge sometimes we're, we're challenged you know people often say we need this belt and braces return on investment business case data 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 but I love the power of a true story and a narrative that goes with it that's the heart yeah, it is of the well-being heart. um so I think if we could take away something from this call that would be you know that would be one of the things for me is really use the power of your people and the stories, the cool. real life stories that people have. Absolutely. Great. So um, I'm just going to wrap up with one final question to all of you, actually, um, which is we're obviously here on this webinar talking about the next wave of well-being. We've heard about some of the great things that you are doing today. Um, crystal ball time or what's on your agenda? What do you all think uh, well-being holds for your organization in the next 12, 24, 36 months? So um, I will start again with, with Sandra. So what does well-being look for you guys in the future at SSE? Uh, for us, SSE is going through quite a period of change at the moment. We sold our um, retail arm to OVO at the start of the year and um, they'll leave um, our benefit support at, uh, next month, actually. So for, for me, the next 12 months, We'll be looking at the shape of the organization that we've got left we'll be going down to about twelve thousand employees from well it was 20 at one point um so there's a, a lot of review on who we have left and what their needs and wants are going to be going forward um but i think also the biggest challenge for us is going to be communication 
Um, I think we've always had great um, reach out to on-site employees and it was always harder for us to reach our field ones. And ironically now we've got everybody working remotely and so that challenge has just got ever bigger. So I think for the next while, um, reaching out to our employees and making sure we reach them all in all aspects of our benefits portfolio as well as the, the wellbeing ones is, is going to be our focus. Thank you, Sandra. I'm actually just going to flip to what there's been a couple of questions in the chat. Um, so just go off script slightly. So Debbie Fennell has asked a question. Um, so jump in anyone who wants to answer this. And you've got my dogs in the background now. So this is now a true webinar experience. Um, so well-being is a board's priority. Um, and yet they don't quite get the importance of financial well-being as it is a taboo. And we don't get feedback on it from employees. They are also worried that employees will start saying you don't pay us enough if we talk too much about financial education. Any thoughts on how to get over that? Anyone want to jump in on that one? Um, I'm more than happy to, 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 to address that, uh, that, Laura. I think for me, um, financial well-being um, is going to, in, in the next few years, is, is, is going to become as important as, as mental well-being is now. You know, over the last few years, we have seen, you know, major strides being taken by employers and leaders to recognise the importance of mental health in the workplace. Um, it's almost like we're going backwards in the sense of there's been a focus on physical well-being. Um, and that's almost the end point where we see poor physical health. And the precursor to that, in some cases, is poor mental health. We're now going back in time. So how do we prevent deteriorations in mental health? Well, what leads to poor mental health? Well, actually, financial well-being and financial health um, will, you know, if we don't address those early enough, they will lead to a deterioration in individuals. So it's almost like we're, we're gradually becoming aware of all the preventative and early intervention approach that we need to take as employers um, on that on that that issue. So. I think um, I think that the question was it was it Debbie um, was saying that that there's this concern around um, pay being the answer. The thing is, once you have you know once you've covered your your, your basic needs, um, whatever they may be, food, shelter, um, and, and 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 so on, more money does not necessarily bring more more happiness and more security. Um, you know, everybody has money problems. The problems, problems don't go away when you have more money. They just change and, and they just improve. Um, and I think everyone, you know, you, you hear people all the time, oh, my life, will be, my life will be, you know, all my problems will be solved by me winning the lottery. All my problems will be solved if I have a pay rise. That's just not true. Um, and the thing is, I think the... The challenge that we have as employers is to actually, um, and I think it was echoed in the in the research um, that, that that Tim shared with us, and and the the, the, the information that, that Suzanne shared with us, it's actually about having control um, and having a, 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 an awareness. There is so much stigma, secrecy, and shame attached to money um, you know, in, in the UK. We just don't like talking about it. We don't like admitting that we get things wrong. We don't like we don't like to admit that we don't understand things, and so on and so forth. So, I think the more we, as professionals um, who our employees are looking to to help us, the more we can encourage dialogue um, around admitting, you know, that we don't know things the more then we have those opportunities to learn. And I think that's where we need to start educating our boards using the research that, that, that Suzanne has, has kindly shared with us today to say that actually financial well-being is at the heart of productivity um, and performance and getting the most out of our employees um, in the way that we have perhaps started to already do with mental health. 
I love that, Alison. I think that's probably the perfect wrap up to finish and conclude the panel. Emily, I have seen your question. Don't worry, I'm sure uh, we will have time to come to that. So I will bank that one ready for the end. Uh, but what we want to do now, I'm handing over to Jeremy, who's really going to take you through. So what does the next wave look like for Nudge and financial wellbeing? So over to you, Jeremy. I'm very aware of time, but it's now uh, my job really to give some thoughts on what we've heard today before the final question. So Firstly, a massive virtual high five and thank you to all our speakers and panelists today. So what were some of the things I heard? So Suzanne, the importance of trust to give us psychological safety. Um, and when she was speaking, I was thinking, wouldn't it be great if we knew we could trust ourselves to make great decisions about our finances because we had the skills and knowledge that we could rely on? And then Sandra, the saying about how little control we have in our lives and actually one of our jobs as an employer is to give some control to people is such a great thing to do. Uh, Lindsay absolutely loved Cap Gemini at home, uh, the team that you've got there. I thought that was that was really good, the way that you explained that. Um, Alison, when you were talking, it was all around focusing on the simplicity of the message. And, and again, I thought that that came across really, really well. Uh, Mark, um, what, what did I hear from you? The fact that if you don't have a well-being strategy in your company at the moment that you are lagging and all about using those real life stories. Um, and then what were the other things I heard? The fact that we can't tackle mental well-being without addressing financial well-being. Uh, it's not about more and more pay for people. It's actually what people want is, um, is control over their finances. So Tim spoke at the beginning about this wonderful state of financial well-being and that it's different for each individual. And before we go into that final question, I just wanted to give you a very few thoughts about what the data tells us about employee financial well-being needs and how they evolve over time. So we have a suite of anonymized aggregated data that we call Nudgenomics, and it shows us how our users are utilizing Nudge in real time. I personally find it endlessly fascinating, but it's also the key tool that allows us to know what to do to help your people. So by way of example, if we look at usage of Nudge before, during and after the first lockdown, what we found was before lockdown, the majority of usage was around forward thinking things like saving pensions, investments. Then during lockdown, users pivoted entirely to areas such as budgeting and everyday finances, which is basically panic mode. How do I preserve and make more of my income? And then post lockdown, first lockdown, um, we sadly saw a 500% increase in people looking at divorce and separation and a 400% increase in people learning how to avoid scams. So the point I'm trying to make is that the financial wellbeing needs of your people are different for each individual based on their particular circumstance, you know, are they a homeowner, do they have dependents, their earnings, their attitude to risk and so forth. But actually those needs change sometimes very rapidly over time. And it's by using that real time data that you can make those evidence based decisions on how to support your people. Now, interestingly, my, fi my final thought that not only are the financial wellbeing needs of each user different, so are the drivers and objectives of each of our clients. So different companies come to us with a different objective from delivering a financial wellbeing strategy. For some, the business case is about supporting diversity and inclusion agenda. Uh, for some, it's about supporting a globally mobile workforce. For others, it's about guiding employees through pension change. For some, it's about freshening up benefit packages. For some, it's about corporate social responsibility and, and others, it's about completing the wellbeing offer. So, yeah, that was my, my key thought, that financial well-being is very different for each individual and how do we cater for that, um, but also financial well-being drivers are different for each of our clients as well. So I'll hand back over to Laura. Thanks, Jed. Well, I'm going to do a quick fire question. So if you can answer it in simply one word, potentially with a bit of rationale behind it, but this was from Emily. So I work for a small business. I've introduced EAP. I've introduced the benefit platform, intranet, etc what might be the best next step to add to have the greatest impact on well-being? So I think if we were to use Jeremy's answer, it'd be the power of data, actually use the data to inform you about what the next step should be. But Alison, Mark, Sandra, Lindsay, quick fire to wrap us up, what would your tip be? Communication for me. 
and now we're in difficult times, the communication that we've been doing previously isn't really working as well. So we need to rethink uh, how we're going to get that out to our people. Thanks, Mark. So better communication. I would have to agree. I, don't, <laughs> I would agree with Mark. Absolutely, communication. Alison, Sandra. Yeah, 100%, um, definitely. It's about reaching out to your people and listening to what they've got to say, listening to what they want. I would agree absolutely with, 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 with Sandra, Mark and Lindsay, communication, but listening is just as important as telling, if not more so. So having launched your EAP and your benefits, listen to what your employees are telling you and then supported with your data, then respond and continue. Yeah. Love that. There you go. Well, hopefully, Emily, that gives you a, a good answer. So combine the power of the data with the, those stories, those anecdotes, listening to your people, and that could inform you of what the greatest next step should be because every business as Jeremy just identified is different so there's not one size fits all but I'm going to wrap up now we are bang on 10 o'clock so a huge thank you to everyone dialing in today we are going to have some follow-up materials um, for you to take away so we'll be in touch and enjoy the rest of your week everyone thank you <laughs>